Hello all, uh, I am Dushyan Dasher and I teach at C, at School of Environment and Architecture. Uh, today, this is the third uh, panel, the fourth panel actually. Uh, this panel is called uh, Forests of Errors and Glitches. We intend to explore opportunities and methods that emerge from an imagination of uh, forest of errors and glitches where the formation is in spatial and an architectural act. Uh, to do, to kind of, you know, start the day, we will have uh, three presentations in our panel uh, before we open up for further conversations. Uh, we have uh, Guillermo Parada and uh, Sebastian Rojas from GTP2, uh, based in Santiago, Chile, and uh, Haoxian and uh, Tinyang uh, uh, from a practice called uh, Frank and Lisa uh, from Beijing, China. Uh, I will start uh, with my presentation, followed by Guillermo and Sebastian, and then Aoshian and Tinyai. So let me share my screen. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll start with a question. What, what, like, what are the logics? Um, what logics are operational beyond the industrial means and imaginations of architectural production? Uh, the current digital wave in architecture has emerged as um, emerged here as a dominant force to imagine build forms and their complexity. New workflows and over access of data has generated new aesthetics of form and space. 3D printing and many such other digital methods of material production have been in pursuit to complete the digital ecosystem for architectural build forms. And we see through this is there is a, there's a protocol process um, and the digital code that has a start and the end point. Interestingly, errors and glitches are points of stoppages and recalibration or redirecting within the start and end conditions of the such processes. But at the same time, we observe there's, uh, there's in the current trajectories in the design process, uh, has this binary relationship of the digital and material uh, where, uh, you know, I see an opportunity here to sort of desanitize or contaminate this systemic loop uh, with an engagement of another kind, an engagement where multiple agencies of craft, culture, intelligence, matter, the human and the post-human could be mobilized. The code, engines, uh, scripts, that set protocol decisions for an output that need to complete in order to give a sense of an output. An error simply stops the process at that very moment, uh, which could, what could errors possibly allow as opportunities that lie in the material and digital intersections, where different types of knowledge is hybridized to generate a new logic of spatial articulation from a digital sense. So what are the methods that, that mobilize these blurred conditions? that emerge from here. And at the same time, allow exploratory frameworks in a design process. So with, these, with this kind of a, a question and a, and a thought, I would like to open up uh, intuition as a method and invoking here, Henry Bergson's idea of intuition and precision, you know, bring in, which brings in an alternative to this systemic ideas of time and space that get generated in the industrial imaginations of architecture and living. Uh, where the industrial ideas of time and efficiency are based and the need for production to fit all the parts in an assembly line. The formulation of the build form and their phenomenologies are kind of you know, limited in the above conceptions. Here, here we see intuition as a method of precision that follows a set of strict rules and brings in knowledge of sensorial capacities into the process. Such capacities allow precise ways of knowing and differentiating lived experiences and realities as an operative method. Now, from the, but, but then, you know, what do we do with uh, intuition? Intuition is here also separated than the, than the gut feel that we know of. Intuition is introduced as, as a kind of uh, lived experience rather than just the gut feel. So, so what, how do we start then, you know, and then we see, we tried to think about how could this really become a method in which uh, we could see many more other possibilities. 
So in our process, we mobilize the idea of an apparatus as an extension to our understanding of intuition as a method. And the framework of an apparatus allows many possible exchanges within a system. It can open up possibilities to afford computational and iterative logics by which we shape materials. The space of the apparatus allows and affords errors and glitches within its systemic framework as a means to produce partial and structural possibilities. It allows us varied possibilities in the duration of a specific process, a sense of time that gets generated by intuitive methods and not industrial logic. The space of experimentation is where we start. And I'll quickly discuss um, two examples that emerge uh, in the series of this uh, experiment. So the, the frame that you see, um, this is a work by students of C within our modules on um, the material research that we do. And a frame is kind of mobilized over here uh, with uh, set geometries within it, where, uh, where we try to kind of uh, make an arc, a vault and an arc, a, a diagram of a vault and an arc, which is kind of come together over here. Uh, to open up, then, then we said, okay, let's uh, look at what is the possibility where uh, our interest in gravity kind of started, you know, with the first experiment. And um, our interest started actually with a cube and we were trying to explore what the cube could possibly allow us. And cube is not just a cube as a form, but cube as a framework over here. And with an ambition to explore uh, gravitational force to shape and form materials, a material can be formed a rather dynamic and a formative aspect of the apparatus that works with gravity or, and, and the material and the composite of glass fiber and resin are both flexible and possible to shape under the forces of gravity. So rather than only deriving diagrams of gravity to make architectural forms, you're kind of into a real time uh, formation of material and, and, and form of matter and form. So a continuous materiality in gravitational suspension was what we were um, exploiting over here. And diagrams of catenary were kind of um, our means uh, to sort of exp to, to go beyond in this process, in this experiment. So as the initial set of experiments, we started with smaller objects like chairs. So here on the left, you can see um, the first uh, suspension of the glass fiber weave. And um, everything else was sort of an iterative computed sort of understanding of the material fall, the material uh, thickness, its density, and the tension that it kind of held within it. Uh, many layers of, and resin were kind of used uh, in step by step. Uh, the first layer sort of adds the weight and then kind of allows a formation of the, the it gives it, it gives it another form. It kind of uh, bulges it. It kind of you know allows that kind of expansion within it, and and the first layer um, kind of gives it the first form. And after many layers, it kind of thickens, um, takes the form, and we also embedded uh, the hand rests within it. Like and but the hand rests were not just a functional mean, but it was also a point where we suspended, where we kind of influenced the fall, the, the fall of the surface within gravity. The moment we dismounted it, unmounted this, uh, we had to then kind of arrive at a, a more uh, a chair-like form. And that's where we started to kind of intervene into uh, beyond the gravitational force and sort of cut it and shape it within its uh, formal possibility. And that's where this, you see, uh, uh, a final outcome over here. This is the first chair, this is the first output of this experiment uh, that was um, kind of successful in that sense, I would say. Um, so beyond this, I mean, the other parts like the, the legs and the supports and the other things were kind of added over here. Then the next experiment, we changed the apparatus itself. We kind of took another, the next turn into this. And instead of a cube, we then started to uh, look at the possibilities where cube could also sort of animate itself and the the gravitational pull um, sort of becomes um, real time you know you could kind of change um, angles you could change the location uh, and um, 
kind of shape the surface within it multiple times without unmounting uh, the fabric. So, so we kind of made this, uh, you know, possible movements or degrees of freedom within the system of the of the particular cube that we made and into an apparatus for it to allow possibilities of material passing through it. You know, it's an apparatus where now the material is kind of passing through this cube uh, because of its performative uh, possibilities. It could kind of, you know, do multiple angles and it's almost like a, a robotic hand, you can say, but made with wood and controlled by humans. Um, the other thing that we were also interested in is to uh, look at the possibility where a, a single person is able to sort of handle the apparatus. It's almost like this connection of a of an apparatus, like a like the the um, distillation process to say a scientist or a chemist or or a person. So this is the this is a this is an this is an experiment. We are still not successful within it. It still requires two people or at least three people to work within it. But yeah, I mean the idea of that. The material passing through this and in turn shaping is what is uh, and to uh, like you can see the the curvature that um, now the material is taking with a particular angle that we are setting to it uh, within the same framework and it kind of changes twice and thrice for it to uh, you know fold come back and loop back in into taking a particular form that you see here on the on the slides in the right. Uh, and just yesterday, almost yesterday, we uh, unmounted this chair and um, it's still a work in progress, but this is where we are currently at. But in this whole process, we also realized that apparatus is a kind of allow uh, a sense of time, a sense of, you know, uh, uh, and afford errors and glitches where, which kind of directs and shapes that whole process. It's not predetermined. It's not, um, you know, it has its own logic of operation. Um, and, and the space of the apparatus, I would like to kind of bring in the space where we operate has many scalar relationships from the domestic context, uh, you know, similar to a space of a kitchen where a personal or individual engagement to a more workshop-based space where here you can see where a group or a pair kind of rescales the thought of making and experiences of the everyday objects. So yeah, I would kind of end here with my uh, presentation and um, I would introduce um, Guillermo and uh, Sebastian, and then we can uh, continue with the presentation. So. Uh, I'll start with Guillermo. Yeah. Guillermo Parada, uh, along with his team, run the studio GTP2, GT2P, sorry, uh, involved in projects uh, of architecture, art, and design established in Santiago, Chile. Uh, their work is oriented towards the continuous process of research and experimentation in digital crafting, uh, promoting new encounters between uh, the technologies for projecting and the richness of the local expression in traditional materials and techniques. Uh, and uh, Sebastian is also an architect and, and with a focus on parametric design uh, and his team, uh, he co-founded uh, GT2P, a collective that experiments at the intersection of art and technology. I think the, the other, uh, the collective, I think we introduced, but I was, I'll also kind of bring in their uh, idea that they sort of work with this para crafting and, uh, we would kind of, uh, we are waiting to kind of see it in your presentation. So with that, we can open up. Thank you, Dushan. Uh, thank you to the schools for having us here. Um, I think our presentation will not so academic uh, as, 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 as you. Uh, our presentation will be more related to our professional work, but uh, first of all, uh, congrats. It's an amazing uh, things you are doing at the school. Uh, and I think we can find some encounters with our work. So I'm really happy about that. Seba? So I'm, I'm really happy to be, to be with you in this session. And I really love your introduction with the idea of intuition as a metal. It's a metal. And on your work and your and in your workshop of the school, I think it's 
really nice and it would be a really really happy experience to explore that being a student. Congrats. So, so let's start. You have to share. Here. Ah, see. <laughs> Not yet. Uh oh. oh. Y ahora sí. This is starting. Yes. You can find us here and here we go. Uh, you or me? I will start. Um, where? Uh, we are GT2P. Uh, we are a Chilean studio based in Santiago, uh, uh, our metropolis. Our metropolis. Um, we mainly work in public art, architecture, and collectible design. Next, please. Uh, our studio is, is founded by four uh, architects, uh, Tamara Perez, Sebastián Rosas, Victor Imperiale, and me. Um, we work in something uh, in between of digital crafting and physical parametrics, something that we have called paracrafting. Um, next. Um, our work can be found in in some institutions like Denver Art Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, the Design Museum in London. Next. Um, and in, in the Copper Hewitt Museum, National Gallery of Victoria, Barbara Date Center, and Miami Design District, among other places. Next. But uh, our work, <laughs> we can say that looks more like that. Uh, we prefer the collective instead of the individuals. Uh, we love uh, try to uh, trying to communicate this idea um, because uh, we can say that in our studio, uh, the ideas running, there are many ideas running in parallel, but when they get uh, intersected each other, uh, appear the new projects. Um, here you can see some images of our studio. It's a mid-century house uh, uh, designed by a very renowned uh, Chilean architect uh, called Mil uh, uh, Miguel Launer. Um, next one. Uh, the house has a beautiful part, but also have an industrial part where we have our ceramic uh, laboratory where, where we melt uh, different kinds of stones, but mainly uh, we started doing it by, uh, with volcanic lava. Next one. And also uh, here's some images from uh, our natural laboratory, our mountain range called uh, Los Andes. Uh, here you can see different kind of volcanoes you can find here. Uh, hey, very high volcanoes like the one on, on your right uh, is, uh, is a, and a crazy uh, volcanic complex. And the other one is the, um, another, another kind of volcanoes in the low part of the, of the, of the geography, almost close to the ocean, uh, like the Osorno Volcano in the left. So in one, you can find obsidian. In the other one, you can find uh, the Pumacite. Uh, so, Seba, if you want, you, you can follow so with this we one. Will... Uh, we will show uh, uh, selected projects and we'll start with this. This is Suple, that's a slang word that in Chile we used to, <laughs> for anything it's not working, you can fix it with a kind of Suple. And we use this project in, or, uh, in order to, to explain to anyone what we think it is uh, parametric design. Hmm. 
va a ser poder de síntesis o there's no sound to it right uh... it should be but that doesn't matter okay lo voy a explicar o no ¿Cuánto tiempo tiene? Un poquito, pues por eso te digo. Ah, ya. Yeah. Este lo veo entero okay. y el otro lo hace todo aburrido. So, basically, here is the, the main idea. Uh, regarding all the, the question of the continuities of, uh, of things in your hand, you, we find this in the trees. So the idea, the, the question was, uh, why to design just one node if we can design all of them? So for that, uh, indeed, this is one of our first projects we did at the studio. So uh, basically we create a rule or, and a grasshopper uh, uh, algorithm in order to create this. So basically this is the step-by-step. -step. You uh, determine the, the dimension of the node. Then uh, with those uh, points, you create a convex hull polygon. That, that convex hull polygon, uh, you create the arrives. Then uh, that geometry gets subdivided and you can relax that, that shape. Uh, and you get these uh, nodes. So uh, basically the idea was uh, to create a DNA of design more than create the design itself. So with that, you can save time. And also you can create the most important part, I think about parametric is that you can create families of objects. So if you cross uh, this DNA with a function, appear a cloth hanger, appear a joint for a table, appear a, a sculpture, or can be a joint for a giant uh, pile uh, structure in a, don't know, uh, in an airport like Heathrow uh, in London. So, next one, please. As so, you can see there, we, we okay. use many uh, Grasshopper plugins, but maybe because this project, it has at, at least 10 years, we started with this at least 10 years ago, <laughs> and maybe now we, we will model it in, in a different way. Maybe we can use subd and multiply. Maybe we, we, will, we wouldn't use too many plugins, for example. So with that idea, we created this big piece. It's a big bench with this uh, central node that it's uh, metal casted in bronze. And it has its branches of uh, stainless steels. And it, it's also uh, supported by a kind of souple, as, you, as, as I said. That's language that way that you use to fix anything because it's rotating and you can make it stable with that suple uh, chunk of lava. We also created this kind of lamps. And that big bench was uh, overscaled because we wanted to be part of a public space. And over there it is, it was a, uh, <laughs> the the suple bench is right now at the in the playground of como digo como surrounded in, in, in the, the gardens of uh, in the gardens of the design museum in london so I, I also i would like to say that here we are also trying to say that new technologies are not for replacing everything new technologies are for uh, to um, to be uh, in connection with our uh, modern heritage, like the uh, um, mass production uh, that occurs at the beginning of the or past, past century. So here we are saying that uh, some parts has to be re uh, related with the new technologies and mass customization, but the rest can be uh, linked with uh, the already industrial ha uh, with the uh, industry we already have. Next one, please. This is the Let's CPP project. This is a project that maybe it's, you, you can explain it better, Willie. Okay. 
So in that period, in that period of time, we were uh, thinking in how we can explain to anyone uh, about what is about parametric designs, even to people who doesn't have to do with the computers. For example, artisans, uh, actually for that, uh, during that period of time, we were working with many artisans in another project that's called uh, Losing My America. Uh, but with this device, we explain to anyone what is about parametric design. Actually, the artisan said, oh, it's, it's super simple. <laughs> Basically, it's a numbered frame where we hang a cloth. Uh, and we, uh, in that cloth, we pour porcelain. Uh, so if, maybe we can run the video. So in that number frame, we hang a cloth. Uh, in that cloth, we pour porcelain in, uh, in a slip porcelain, liquid, I mean. Uh, in some point, the, the slip uh, stop passing through the, the cloth and we have to remove the excess with a syringe. So basically the piece is all the thing that is attached to the, to the cloth. And in some point uh, we can peel off uh, the piece and that piece can be uh, fired uh, in a kiln. So I think this project um, give us a new scope uh, in, in our studio or in that period of time, of course, that was more related to create more parametric than more uh, instead of digital. So I think uh, give us a, a, a new uh, new ideas to think in parameters um, of the materials and not uh, exactly related with the with the software like a grass copper or or computers, and this also uh, we can say intro introduce the idea though, uh, about not uh, about the not representing. Uh, brainy ideas. Uh, we can say here, up here, uh, represent the process itself, re it's represented here. Uh, so we can say that's, that is an, uh, a process expressionism. So here you can see the, uh, the texture of the cloth. You can see how many times was pure. Uh, the exterior, uh, the interior has the liquidness of the slip. Uh, so it's super expressful of the of the process. Next, also and also it is, ah, sorry. as it is porcelain, it's uh, translucent. So we we also can, we created some uh, shaders for lights, and at that period of time we experimented. <laughs> Uh, putting some little rocks of uh, lava over a piece of porcelain and we um, they went together to the kiln and we realized that in, when they uh, melt and well the rock get melted and and then it get attached to the porcelain so with that uh, discovery we just started to create some new kind of things like these uh, wall lights and, and another thing and another pieces with uh, hanging the cloth but almost horizontal we created that, that other pieces we created also that chandelier that is uh, using the translucent of the porcelain and that piece that it has been a very important uh, piece for us because it was it was acquired by the med uh, the Met Museum in New York, um, because the, the curator said that the, that the value of the piece is related to a way to see the computation in analog way in the 21st century, that it was something, I don't know how to say, maybe innovative, but, but using a kind of prehistoric materials in a computation thinking <laughs> way. Yeah. Um... And here we started, we also, uh, started increasing the scale of the of the projects, of the of the pieces. Uh, next one, please. So we create those kind of big frames, and uh, those big frames. Uh, for example, this one is a 
uh, a very clear, um, how can I say, uh, representative thing related to mistakes, for example, or, or, uh, or glitches and errors. For example, this, uh, this um, disk can be peeled off from the, um, from the cloth because uh, if we peel off the piece, uh, this uh, disk get broken. So we have to fire it together uh, inside the kiln. And then we discovered that all the drops get attached to the, to the, to the piece. So this and add an, another layer of possible expressions just because we can't remove the, 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 the cloth that was uh, the first molding. So appear a new expression that is beautiful. So with that uh, information, we can systematize that idea and uh, put it together in the, in the, in the process, uh, how can I say, task for do something. Um, next one. Make it rapid, you know. So uh, in the previous project also, uh, we realized that the, uh, the, the volcanic stone get melted at the same point that the porcelain gets strong inside the kiln. So in that little point, that little point become in a project itself because of uh, that trial uh, give us the idea that we can control the next ones. For example, uh, so basically we started melting uh, volcanic lava, uh, creating two methods. One is a solid uh, casted uh, volcanic stone and the other part in the left part of your screen, you can see the covering of uh, like, a, yeah, like a layer, like a coating uh, of volcanic uh, stone over refractory materials like ceramics, uh, concrete, uh, like other uh, refractory materials. Dale. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Dale. Here's some images of the volcanoes. So uh, here is an idea that uh, the volcano um, tried to, when the volcano explodes, revealed all the geography. So you can't discover what was under the, the, the territory. So it reveals the geography. Uh, but um, our question was how we can keep uh, some geometries under the, this uh, destructive material in a way. Uh, next one. So here, uh, basically we create a ceramics revolution and those ceramics revolution was coded with this, uh, with this material. And here you can see how, the, how is the process. Here is how we collect the material. <laughs> it was super fast, but <laughs> um, basically we ground them uh, to powder. Uh, with that powder, uh, we mix that with a kind of molasses. Uh, we create a paste uh, that can be attached by hand uh, to a ceramic. And uh, then we put, to uh, we put together the, the, the the piece inside the kiln and we fired. So inside the kiln is where we can uh, control uh, the temperature curves or temperature gradient ramps uh, in order to create different effects uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the volcanic lava. We can create porous material, uh, a lot of bubbles. Uh, we can create, we can control also uh, the color we can control the brown, some uh, the brown color or the black color or gray color, depending of the temperatures you fire the piece. Next one. So, in a way, we can say that we are also 
uh, doing parametric design, but not with the traditional computer. We are creating with the we are working with the computer of the of the kiln, so where we are where we can uh, control the gradient ramps. So it's a different way that the typical ceramist uh, uh, say. Uh, make because the typical ceramics uh, bar uh, make variations with the uh, chemical composition. Here we are uh, variating with the temperature uh, to uh, create different effects in the using exactly the same material. Um, they are in different uh, collections and they were uh, nominated by the Design Museum of the Year, by the Design Museum uh, for Beasley Design of the Year. Uh, here some uh, uh, change of scale of this project. Dale eso. Rápido nomás. Bien. Tú me decís, ahí estoy en la herramienta. Que tenemos so, un delay yeah. entre que la paso y se ve. Okay, so here we have different kind of uh, toolings we have at, at, the, at the studio, like struders, like pottery wheels, like um, slab, roller slabs. And with that, we created, a, a, how can I say, a very conservative way to create ceramics uh, in, in order to create uh, one section, the same section thickness in the entire piece in order to avoid cracks. And um, so we create monolita series. Uh, also in a way to pay homage to the feminine power of the studio, because all these pieces are created by, uh, by the feminine power. <laughs> of the studio. Um, uh, next one. Uh, so we started thinking in creating uh, domestic objects, but also what if we can create uh, architectural uh, things that can be uh, created uh, in different scales. Here, so you can see some monolita chairs. Next. And some uh, screen uh, atoms that uh, are working now. <laughs> it's super uh, difficult the uh, change of scale in ceramics. Uh, they are super slow pieces uh, in in the making. I mean, uh, here you can see that drastically different uh, differences uh, of different effect, effects we can reach. Uh, from very smooth ones, black, and also very bubbled and browny. And now we are creating this kind of a kind of uh, Pixar objects <laughs> that has the uh, those little lamps that yeah, yeah, <laughs> or more serious architectural things like that. This collection it's supposed to be presented in Basel uh, during the pandemics, but never happened. But we reach a beautiful article written by Dejan Suchik that was super honored for us. Here you can see some uh, um, main experiments we have been doing during the, the stu uh, during our career uh, in lava. Uh, here a uh, piece we did for uh, an architectural device we did for a collector that he commissioned us on. Uh, it's important here, the, the, I think, when you work with, with clients, uh, how uh, the clients, uh, uh, how can I say, um, gives you an amazing, an amazing uh, input for creating things. We love uh, working with commissions because uh, there are more, uh, how can I say, they enrich the, the process. So basically here we create a, a device, uh, uh, an architectural device is he uh, commissioned us a totem and, and we create for him an anti-totem. The totem is for look at the object and we create an object and a totem that, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to look through the totem and catch some views and, uh, uh, and some memories or no, no memories, uh, more related to the, your future. And of course the totem is for the past. Um, here are some images of, of the piece. Uh, this one is uh, one of the most uh, difficult piece executed, uh, I think in, in terms of uh, making because you have one handcrafted, completely handcrafted uh, 
volcanic uh, modules and also you have those rings that are created uh, in CNC perfectly uh, in order to, 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 to make the, the device work. So, well, we, um, regarding the glitches, uh, we, ha we have made this project. Maybe we started with this also 10 years ago because we had a 3D printing machine that never worked fine. It was always glitching. So when we saw that glitch too many times, we thought that maybe we can use that expression as, or we can think that that printed object has the expression of what the machine really wants to do, not regarding to make your perfect parametric object. So with that, we create this project uh, called Dysgraphia. Um, maybe we, we will go very fast. We created, we, what we had to do was to create our own way to print using Rhino, Grasshopper and the machines. And we started to see the, this kind of uh, material characteristic like these catenary things, the texture on the pieces. And we created and discovered new things on the three printed things. Then we mix it with the remote project and we started to print with the stone in order to create some sculptural pieces that can be made by hand because we used to uh, sculpt it in another way. We will go very fast, maybe you are on time. And we experimented <laughs> in, uh, attaching different pieces, creating some texture with syringe at the first time. And then we started to work with our 3D printing machine with, that has a kind of very huge syringe. And we programmed it in order to create some architectural pieces like benches, for example, like this is a kind of stool. And it has very, we, we love that kind of thing that maybe appear like the textures. And also this kind of a sculptural piece we can say. And now we are uh, putting together a kind of plastic and stone piece and we are uh, transforming the, the extruded device uh, in order to print in plastic. This we is the last one. That, we, 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 we can say in the previous one, we can say that uh, all those glitches that we discovered 10 years ago now are controlled and, and are part of the, of the expression of the piece. Um, yeah, and those those glitches are systematized and now part of our process. Dale. The, the new one is called uh, self-organization. <laughs> and was um, uh, inspired on some uh, experiments of Freyoto in order uh, Freyoto create things uh, with two holes in order to create their uh, catenary structures. And <laughs> we thought, uh, what if we add more holes, basically, and appear these Boronoi uh, diagrams in a, um, in a physical way, very quick and very easy. So here we are using uh, the, how can I say, the, the gravity uh, as a former. And also you can create it, uh, you can program uh, the shapes, but also you can work like a Pollock and create the things in a very freely way. And now we are creating some uh, objects like the ones you are seeing. And also we are creating panels uh, that can be used for acoustic uh, propo uh, propose, uh, ah, uh, functions because it has the shapes and also it has the, the, the inertia of, of the, the mass. And we, can, we would like to finalize with, the, with an intervention we did uh, Design Miami Design District. Um, basically it's an, an uh, architectural um, um, installation. Um, that is called uh, conscious actions and reflect about the energy that we consume and the energy we give back to the to the environment and also uh, related to the uh, to, to 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 be conscious about the 
consequence that your has that your action has uh, in your direct environment. Dale, se va. And we like to present this in this kind of presentations because we can say here is uh, the main process itself is always working. Dale el video nomás directo. Don't know if it, it, it's like a gif, very chak, chak, chak. Here it, you, we can see it very, very fluid. But basically you, when you swing, you pull the you pull the louvers the, or the wings um, and they are connected each other <coughs> and create this ripple effect uh, when the day is very sunny you can uh, it cast all the shadows in the floor and it, and it creates uh, beautiful effects um, also it's a way to um, to create interactions with kids and parents and it's, it's a beautiful process uh, that create the entire installation. Here is the, the engine we can say. Uh, there um, is a spine that is created by many, uh, springs. many springs that create all this uh, system work in a kind of sinusoidal thing way. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for the timing, uh, but yes, muchas gracias. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, I will quickly move on to introducing uh, Haoshan and uh, Tinyang. Uh, Haoshan and Tinyang are um, assistant lecturers at the School of Architecture, the University of Hong Kong. They both received their master's degree from Cooper Union and their master's and bachelor's degree from uh, Tingshua University. Their teaching and uh, research revolve around surrealistic uh, design representation and material culture in the age of mass production. Uh, their works have been exhibited at Carnegie, Carnegie Museum of Art, National Museum, National Building Museum in the US, and the Beijing Design Week, uh, PMQ in Hong Kong, uh, CMU, Pratt, the, Co the Cooper Union, in addition to multiple other institutes. They have collaboratively and independently um, worked under the authorship of Frank and Lisa. So with this, I invite uh, Havshan and Tinyang to start the presentation. Hi, right. thank you so much, Tushan, for the lovely introduction. Thank you. And it's a great pleasure to have, um, have the chance to listen through such thorough presentations from GT2P. Um, it's an amazing body of work. And I'm very happy to see, um, actually um, very impressed to see a coherence um, retained in the accumulated body of work, especially when you guys have four people, four partners, and probably more helping hands throughout the process. But nonetheless, the consistency is very much visible. And I do appreciate that. And, and Dushan, it's, um, it's also amazing to see your pedagogical experiments. And I think we can have uh, a lot of dialogues today. All right. Um, so why don't we share the screen there? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Um, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tian Ying. Uh, this is my partner, Hao Tian. Um, just to briefly introduce ourselves again, we're a Hong Kong based uh, design studio exploring at the fringe of the discipline through teaching, ex exhibitions, prototyping, and writing. So both of us are teaching at the University of Hong Kong, and this is reflected in our mode of working and the character of our works. Um, although not every single exploration is translated into teaching, they're nonetheless argumentative, discursive, and methodic, just like every course. Um, and much of our contemplation lies in the medium or tools and the material, both um, digital and physical. Um, so today we will use um, the three digital materials as a thread to introduce a series of works. Um, they are mesh points and surfaces. Um, a large part of our work deals with the realistic images. Realistic image is a theme that we will come back to a few times in this short talk. 
Here we were experimenting with photogrammetry. Um, photogrammetry is a technique that generates a photographic model from pictures. So this was one of our first projects that we scanned. This type of plastic bag, like have a nice day bag, is the most banal yet iconic element in New York City, uh, where we study. Um, we try to create a um, digital replica, but in fact, it actually amplifies this mistranslation in its process and celebrates the flaws and technique. Um, in order to run the photogrammetry, we need to take a series of photos surrounding the object in a static environment, and the algorithm will try its best to guess what the object looks like in the 3D. And what you see on the right-hand side is a 3D model generated. Part of it has a higher resolution because more photos were set into the program, but the background appears as a blurry blob on the country. The original bag was scanned, meshed, unrolled, printed, cut, and then connected back with the zip ties. And in each step, the replica looks a bit different from the previous step. And we tried not to exaggerate that difference. However, eventually we arrive at a state um, between this familiarity and uh, estrangement, neither realistic nor unreal. Um, and this is something that we look for in almost all our works. Um, in another series, uh, this exploration was merely imagery. And this, it is less about material, but more about, let's say, materiality, the sensorial experience of material that an image can evoke. Um, here, we speculate different material qualities of the same scan scene. Sometimes the digital material in the image references an actual material in reality, like the previous slide of jelly, this one of a fluffy carpet, while other times um, the image is further away from um, realisticity, like this one, where the textures of the objects can only be seen in each other's reflections, so only reflect once. Um, more than just mere eye candies, we, all, we hope those images can evoke a wide spectrum of senses, not just vision, but also associations with texture, smell, sound, weight, atmosphere, etc. cetera. Um, in this conventional architectural drawing, the rich association with human sensorium is usually the missing puzzle. And whenever two of us work with the digital images, drawing is always the, this counterpart. In our opinion, this example on the screen, the drawing by Mirias and Eva Katz, best exemplifies the purpose of architectural drawings, which is to abstract, um, to say, to translate an object or a space into uh, instructions. So those instructions are there for it to be potentially executed elsewhere by someone else. So imagine you can execute this um, person somewhere, somewhere else. And therefore, the drawings communicate and idealize reality with its clear hierarchy. However, then what about the complexity of this world or the entanglement with the human faculty that cannot be reduced to just lines? Um, so uh, I hope the video is working well though. Um, here we try to simulate the physical behavior of the same branch. Um, just like the drawings, these images and videos are also imaginations of a different reality, yet um, the differences only pertain to the materiality, not to the original one. The qualities um, that refuse the conceptualization. So uh, with um, maybe the next slide. Oh yeah, this one. Uh, with this fabric simulation, after you drape those um, cloths and squeezing it into the approximate shape of the actual uh, brunch, we then printed the fabric and then tried to follow the digital simulation in reality. Here, it probably links back to the first plastic bag project that we introduced. And once again, we want to celebrate the gaps in between this reality and its copy and to imagine a world that is not brand new, uh, but just a little different and different in a un quite uncanny way. 
Now, I guess the, the premise of everything shown above was probably that the scanned data was represented as meshes, um, something with two sides and immediate connotations of paper and fabric. Well, yet scanned data does not naturally end up as meshes. Uh, it is more often that it appears as point clouds. So although point cloud and mesh, they could easily transform into each other, those two digital materials do call for different modes of operations and different imaginations. So here we are showing a, a different trajectory, although using a similar method. Um, this is probably the origin of all of our experiments. Um, an apple that we scanned three years ago, uh, the apple was soon eaten after the scanning, but is digital copy nonetheless persists as something like this, a translucent thin layer of points um, documenting the geometry and the texture of the found object. Um, then in these series of um, animations, the apple disintegrates, deforms, and develops. It is distorted, mirrored, and refracted in various mathematic patterns Instead of regarding the apple as a malleable object, we see it as the indicator of the folding of space, just like the ink that scientists will put into water to observe its flow, or the shiny particles that portray the shape of a black hole as in the film Interstellar. All of these are essentially one apple moving through non-Euclidean spaces. Um, the folded space is static, and the original apple does not change its shape and its movement. Um, it does not freeze at any frame, although each frame can potentially be a solid form. However, more, of, more often the apple is ever growing and evolving because in our mind, it doesn't matter what the object actually looks like. It could be an apple, an orange, or just anything, um, any found object. Its only purpose here is to map the distorted field. Um, aesthetically, we're searching for a balance between mathematic order and realistic references. We did this series of videos using scanned Buddhist or Taoist figurines, and they come from, well, um, personally, two, two very specific obsessions. First is that in Hong Kong, there are a lot of these kind of little um, tiny altars or shrines where citizens spontaneously put statues of different religions together. Um, some are in charge of fortune, some safety, and the citizens will also put food and plants here to serve their gods. So it usually results in this um, very colorful micro space in the city. While the other obsession uh, of us is with hyperdimensional objects. For example, this scene is a revolving tesseract I don't know how choppy it is. Let's assume it's um, playing smoothly. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically a four-dimensional cube that is rotating while projected onto the three-dimensional space uh, perspectively. And on each facet of the tesseract, there is a three-dimensional altar. So all of these animations are also, um, well, on a, on a side note, it's also a kind of a heritage of the parametric age where we see a lot of fluid um, building masses transforming into each other, right? So I guess that's, that's still quite common in some practices where uh, we want to prove to the client that we have a thousand possible choices for them to select and eventually we just randomly pick one, right? So, but however, um, you know, those messages of flexibility or adaptability eventually dissolves and what is left is the aesthetic experience of this ever evolving phantom. And that's one of the starting points of this set of works. All right, and then at, as the last part of the works uh, to be presented today, we wanna to go back to some explorations that are more um, conventionally architectural. If we say the previous works are harnessing errors that are inherent in the processes, to echo the, the title of today's talk, right? Um, here, we are consciously constructing conditions for errors to happen. Um, this, well, the following works we're gonna show is first inspired by the stereotomic tradition in architecture, particularly the intelligent use of conic surfaces to negotiate uh, orthogonal planes. 
Um, what we see on the right hand side is a, is a beautiful um, drawing and analysis done by Robin Evans, which explains the construction of the geometry. Um, so the skillful moves of projection and intersection created an anomalous yet elegant moment. And we are also amazed to see such complex geometry generated through very simple operations. So just like many architects who got inspired, we also try to take this further. Um, here we are using the same geometric technique um, in the design of these three joints. We also constructed cones to connect orthogonal geometries, but this time um, under a, I guess, more or less surface condition instead of a volumetric one. And as the scale changes, the condition of the cone changes too, and that leads to different expressions. Some are um, more um, organic, bigger flowers, and some more, more constrained, smaller ones. Um, the drawings were designed for irreconcilable structural pieces, um, geometrically irreconcilable, which is to say that the, the, the structural pieces, they don't meet at the same spot, and that gives room to the expressive flowery cones to function. And, well, I guess that is the same as all architectural drawings because a joint usually articulates the structure precisely because of the incompatibility. For example, if you have two different kinds of material, then we add a third piece between them to negotiate the different structural performances. Right? Um, so in these drawings, cones are avoiding each other in space and that's why they remain complete. Um, however, in another scenario, cones will intersect with each other and that's why they cannot stay complete anymore and naturally they become something um, of a, like a dovetail relationship um, so you know come into each other like this and they become realistic leaves and flower petals um, in our further development so here we introduce realistic images again but this time intentionally to resolve the geometric problem. Right? What we want to pursue is this duality, um, both appearing imagery and essentially well controlled by geometric rules. For example, here we started from very simple conic surfaces and then calculated the exact intersection and then figure out the, the profile afterwards. Um, here is um, essentially the same except for a more complex geometry. Uh, here in, a, in another set of joints, quote unquote, um, we were also swinging back and forth between image and drawing, the rich connotations and the well-controlled geometry. Um, here there are two joints, one resembles bones, uh, the other flesh, because we argue that the assembly of building parts is nothing different from the movement of bones around the joint or how the bodies hold on to each other. Um, so well, this time, it is still a geometric game to some extent, but it is more complex as it also involves the movement and the trajectory of each part, not just a static uh, position. So um, as demonstrated in, in this set of drawings, it's also a balance between constructed geometry and free form because to make sure the movement can happen, the rails must be constructed accurately, yet the rest of the joint has the freedom to evolve into expressive form. And, um, and, and here we can attach different um, connotations onto the form as well. Here's another joint, which is essentially a bolt and a nut. And we think the process of loosening a bolt is not so different after all from a baby given birth. And that's also the inspiration of the form. All right, so uh, in fact, this was, uh, this was uh, the, the last page of our presentation, but we just added a few more pages uh, to have a dialogue with what we just saw in the other talks. Uh, well, anyways, um, so besides the contemplation of on medium tool processes 
at the end of the day, we are exploring an aesthetics between abstract and realistic. So the works intentionally remain at a strange distance from reality, if, if I might say, neither too far to lose the reference of the real world, nor too close to, re to, be, to be reduced to a mere replica. So we want to generate frictions, not a simple reading or argument. And we hope our work demonstrate both some level of irony and playfulness and also um, sincerity and seriousness. Um, after seeing uh, a lot of beautiful experiments done with natural materials, we, we also just uh, pull out a few images uh, here, uh, which looks like they are in the same dialogue. However, building a very strong contrast, uh, in fact, so this one we see here is uh, uh, actual shells scanned and then we printed the, the extrusion. The right? Only the, the surface that's contacting the shells and then all those, uh, the major body of those uh, printed volumes are the natural supports, like the automated supports of the 3D printer. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I guess besides the, the process, we're looking for a coexistence between um, accurate machine, machinic operation plus natural objects. Um, except that, well, I have, I guess I have one last comment on this uh, in relation to the others, except that we are in fact control freaks. Like um, we, in this whole process, everything is modeled in the most detailed way possible. That's why we can control the CNC to carve out the exact negative surface uh, of the tree branches or the shells. Oh, this one is done in collaboration with our colleague Chang and uh, with students um, in Hong Kong U. All right, so uh, I guess our sharing will end here. Uh, we'll pass on the microphone back to Dushan. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such lovely uh, presentations. So uh, I will not attempt to draw similarities between all the works because that was not the intent or summarize in a, you know, in, in, in very uh, clear specific ways, but I would like to kind of keep this uh, conversation fuzzy in the, way, in the way that all our methods and processes are kind of, you know, uh, shown today because I was just trying to bring in uh, both these practices like uh, GT2P and, and Frank and Lisa. And the sense of materiality that's there in both of these works is something which was interesting for, for, for me to sort of bring into this, uh, into this panel. And I think uh, the digital somewhere is, uh, you know, kind of a, is kind of a backdrop, is kind of a background where it kind of allows those material processes to happen or kind of the material to kind of take shape or translate itself into a complete analog process like the method that uh, that Guillermo and Sebastian kind of uh, showed us today I think and and in and in your work uh, Haoshan and Tinyang is is the the digital becomes uh, you know the means by which um, you really break down the clarity of uh, you know the, the the geometry of actually actually I, the way I would actually read it the geometry of uh, from the anet no trump of anet you you break actually that sense of uh, geometry and bring it to a, a material realm no? with the with the with the point cloud and I think that 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 it it loses the form of the apple itself and kind of you know brings in um, other aspects of uh, um, you know, reading material through through actually digital phenomenological uh, senses, right? I think that's where I would want to kind of you know take the next set of uh, discussions and uh, you know kind of bring in the question of um, the the awareness actually, which uh, in case of um, GT2P was kind of you know the digital awareness was kind of there to mobilize. Um, the materials that they were kind of working with, and and in and in your case, I think uh, it was um, the the sense of mathematics which was mobilized through the digital, and it kind of it um, you know the folding of uh, space that really was brought about, which you know 
uh, bring, puts it into the realm of the real and the unreal. You know, the image is gone, the object is kind of lost, but there is a sense of material which is present by which you are reading that uh, reading that materiality. So I just kind of you know bring in these few aspects. I don't I didn't want to necessarily kind of you know draw a common uh, ground over here because I I feel that these uh, fragments are really important to kind of bring out in their own ways. So yeah, if you anybody would want to respond to, sure. Yeah, I, I would like to follow um, with my my observation and comment on top of that, uh, and I think also just uh, picking up these words from your comment, Dushan. I think this pair of word of material versus materiality helps establishes uh, a way to understand all of the words presented. So when we again um, now talk about material experiments, um, are we talking about the you know how much are we talking about the actual material performances in reality, and how much are we talking about the experiences of that material, which is um, motivated by a variety of human faculties. So I think those are two different things. They sometimes overlap, but now because of the prevalence of digital technology, um, they are somehow obscured because, you know, a lot of the works that we've been doing is to argue that with a simple image, it can evoke the same experience and even different experience of materiality, even if the material is not there, right? So, and I also see that um, in, in you know, both of your body of works um, because the material, although it actually performs in reality, but at least from what I can see, it, I see that on a screen. Yet nonetheless, I feel the material quality. That's, that is to say that, you know, some, features of the material is, is successfully conveyed through the medium of, of image. And that doesn't require uh, me to go there and really touch that. I can still feel the temperature, the, the weight, um, the texture, et cetera. Yeah. So, Tai <laughs> Mudia. No, that, that they do. Okay. okay, so just one thing I would like to say that in our case, we love playing with materials. So um, at the beginning, we can say that we were super, how can I say, computer guys. And um, we thought that everything was going to be uh, builded by machines and uh, and their human, uh, how can I say? Uh, sorry. At the beginning, we can say that uh, we believed that everything was going to be built by machines and, and the human it's gonna be in the bed resting and having fun, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, that was our naive uh, vision when we uh, just uh, um, get out, uh, when we finish uh, our studies at the architectural things. But then when we start doing our company or studio, or whatever, we started, we, re we realized that um, the encounters of digital and the material world was a, a, a new world, and a, it was a, something that where we st uh, we started imagining new things. So, when you I, I I want when you don't make the things, I think uh, you are missing an important part of the history of the, of of the making. I think digital uh, allow us to um, to dream in a way. But when, when you make the things, uh, you find other things uh, where you started to dreaming. And uh, in some parts you create the nightmares or <laughs> you create the, 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 the real, the real um, how can I say, uh, the real projects. 
Um, I'm not saying that digital uh, works are, uh, are not complete. I'm just saying that we love making. Uh, and in, in the making is where you find new information to design. So related to, to the main questions, um, of, of, this, uh, of this talk related to glitch and errors. Um, I would say that uh, you mainly find uh, old glitches and uh, all those errors in the making. There, there is where you find uh, your real challenge. Um, and, and it's not just challenge, it's, the infor it's new information that gives you new expressions. Perhaps uh, as, we start, uh, as we started making too many things, we, uh, we didn't discover too much uh, new things as uh, you guys in China have been doing uh, uh, digitally. So that also encourages us to be back in the computers again uh, more deeply. So I think it, this is a, something that is a back and forward, but um, but yes, I, I think I said something <laughs> that um, the discoveries are when you are get passionate and when you go deeply in something. Uh, uh, and in, in this uh, little, um, as, as Sebastian say, when you look, ¿cómo se podría decir eh, mirar distraído? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phrase in Spanish. When you look something uh, not with uh, too much attention, but when, when you're, uh, how can you say, when you look uh, not focused, when you look aside, you discover some things. You, you said uh, there is where the Eureka's come, but Eureka has to be proven uh, through an action. Through that action for us is the making. Sorry, don't know if I said <laughs> it was yeah. super dispersed my comment, but uh, trying to say uh, many things uh, in a little short time. Yeah, no, it's actually I actually these are interesting thoughts, and I would like to bring in um, the you know the the cultural uh, sense of souple, like fix anything, no. Like it's when you dream, you dream from your own, uh, you know, sense of uh, belonging, where you're from. You dream what you, uh, you know, also dream kind of has the ambitions, but also the grounding of, you know, where you are. And I think within that range, um, and, that, and when you said digital as a dream, and I was just trying to think that, you know, we have uh, been um, into this space, you know, kind of surrounded by screens, surrounded by uh, tools uh, that that allow us to make things. And we are con now, it's almost become a part of our, um, the digital has become a part of our um, intuition in that sense. And I, I'm, I'm trying to bring in, again, the Bergson, the Henry Bergson's um, idea of intuition, which kind of, you know, along its uh, time, duration, and there is a sense of seeing which kind of comes in from there. And I think uh, where uh, the new aesthetics sort of are coming from are, are these kind of gaps, which the, the gaps between the digital and the material that, you know, kind of allow that possibility. And, and what Haushan was kind of trying to bring in the sense of materiality rather than material is where I think it kind of, you know, uh, is able to sort of bind uh, these uh, thought processes and these methods, and and also kind of fuzzes the the question of the experience. You no, know, that kind of opens up from from here on, as in like the um, the, the 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 comment from Haushan where he could kind of sense the the temperature or the the texture of uh, the object that you know uh, was kind of casted or um, sorry uh, from the kiln. Or maybe like the way we could, I mean, I could sense um, the the apple, the form of the apple, actually the materiality of the apple, but not the form of it, no? through all of those uh, multiple surreal and dreamlike uh, conditions that say uh, an AI engine sort of, or maybe a, a mathematical engine sort of, uh, you know, generated. So I think it's a, this is like an interesting space no? within which we could 
kind of start thinking of i know maybe i'm i am also dreaming but uh, but i but i i see that kind of a interesting zone over here to to kind of think of uh, phenomenal phenomenological possibility possibilities uh, of the new of the current thought of materiality that we that we have here i mean in terms in terms of tiktok or instagram language we can talk about the expectations and reality <laughs> but i would say for the students that uh, if you have some expectations in your head and you have a result uh, in the reality don't get mad and don't get disappointed is there where is the knowledge came from and you can have that knowledge to make it better in the next way so yeah i think that is the important thing of the glitch and the errors in the in the creative field well, a, a quick comment following that if the students find their computer crashing then don't get frustrated either right so i just want to say that it, it's, it'll be fun to look at where the glitch comes from. Is it coming from the digital realm or the physical realm? I guess, uh, well, I want to say not only from the physical realm, right? I, on one hand, the yeah. glitch can be understood as the imperfections, but on the other hand, the, com well, the algorithms in the computer, they are complex enough to have their own flaws and errors, which is also in the end becoming the qualities of the work, something that we can embrace and uh, exploit. Yeah. Actually, the, the, the expression of the project, uh, the Apple project is amazing. Uh, I don't know if I get it well, but it came from that some parts don't get scanned very well or, or just you get, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's amazing that project. Have you made an uh, uh, NFT with that one? <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> You're losing money. <laughs> For a while, well, then, then all of us are lo losing money every single second because a lot of people <laughs> are in the corners you don't know in the world. So I don't know. We, we, are, we are too slow to follow. Speaking about the engine, I do have a question for, uh, for uh, greetings to people, you guys. Um, I wonder, since um, I, 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 we, I'm, we're also interested in, in making, on the other hand, um, I'm thinking um, like uh, in making is always uh, an output for towards the, the form. And I wonder when you're designing, let's say, how much effort do you put into, let's say, a rough uh, form that you um, process through the algorithm and how much effort do you put into that algorithm or the engine itself? Um, this is more towards some of the works, such as um, forgot the name of the work that cast the the, the soft uh, cast upon the soft the, the sleep casting uh, with yeah. the cloth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that. I think it's not related with efforts. I think we can't measure the the efforts, uh, <laughs> but uh, I think. Uh, how can I can explain? In a way, as we were trained as an architect um, uh, in the in the pre no I don't know I, we can say that it was in the digital era when we when um, we had some teachers from Colombia we had teachers from Net the Netherlands that came from with the idea with make uh, we think in a parametrical way. I think uh, for us, we can say that we are putting efforts. We, we are saying that we are thinking as we were trained. Yeah, first, first idea. So thinking parts, thinking variables to make something. Um, but uh, first to understand, what do you mean with effort first? Um, <laughs> maybe the question is more about how much do you anticipate the final form? For instance, ah, okay, 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 is it yeah. towards that uh, conic form, like the, 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 like the flowery uh, cone that you created with the drapery? And or how much do we anticipate the errors or glitches that machine can create? That is something that I'm always interested in. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah. similar to computers. So. There, there are, there are, there, of course, there, there is a big part, uh, there is a big period of, of uh, try and error, and errors, and errors, trial and errors, uh, where we uh, try to, um, how can I say, to systemize, systematize or systemize, no, come on, how is the word, systematize? Systematize, yeah. Systematize uh, the information for do something. For example, uh, what kind of cloth we use there, uh, the amount of sleep uh, we put in the in the thing, uh, the time uh, we we leave uh, the sleep inside the um, the cloth. So, of course, at the beginning there is a a, a period uh, uh, in order to 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 create the knowledge to do something, right? But at the end. If you control, if you think that you control everything, always there will be things that you miss. For example, the wind. Uh, so you put uh, to create exactly the same base uh, with the same variable, the same anchor points, the same amount of of uh, sleep. But that uh, in that day uh, was. Um, uh, a, a little breeze or little wind. So you have, we can say you have the twins. You can create those both similars, but if you look at them very close, they are different. It's like the twins. They have exactly the same DNA, but uh, they have some little difference that make them uh, unique. And yeah, I think uh, you can control things but also there are some things that you can't control. For example, in the 3D printing, uh, where, where uh, we can control the code, uh, we can control the, the uh, we can visualize in, even in the, in the grasshopper files, the path that uh, the machine is gonna make. But at the end, uh, perhaps the um, humidity, the, the the moisture of the of the the sleep wasn't exactly as the day before. For example, uh, you can get uh, more uh, uh, bigger catenaries, and if you have exactly the same uh, process, you have different pieces. Uh, even though if you have uh, the same parameters you did the day before, so yes, in, in your, uh, answering your question, yes. You have, uh, you have uncontrolled things uh, under the controlling your chaos or something like that. But I, we love that because that uh, allow us to create unique, uh, allow us to create unique things. So it's in fact not the not the precise control that uh, you are searching for, but in fact the balance between controlling and not controlling. Exactly. But in fact, you're you know also controlling that. You're controlling the right proportion of what is controlled. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, well, inside uh, the kiln. But, actually, inside the kiln, all the bubbles. Uh, you 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 can you have an idea that you will have an a bubble piece, a very bubble piece. But you will you can't say that I'm gonna have a thousand of bubbles with uh, this exactly color of uh, this amount of brown. No, you, you will know that you can have some brown and bubbles, <laughs> but not exactly. I think that, it, uh, that it's process is not less. just mathematic. Maybe it, to me, there's always the question when you find the pressure on the piece, because it's something that you feel. Maybe because I, I get really amazed with your work, guys. And I, and I think that when you're making that process, when you deconstruct the apple and it's creating some new shape, maybe you can feel a lot of pressure doing that. And you, you just can say a little bit when you feel, I, you feel you, you have the pressure to make it. And you say, well, I will stop now because I really like it. Because it, it doesn't have a, some time. It's not, I think it's not something too accurate. Maybe you just say, I like this piece. I like this animation. I like my object. And you create a process. But maybe <coughs> we're not looking for what we have in mind, what we want to get it. Maybe when you discover something and you say, I get a real pleasure with it, 
you can say, well, I, I will stop. <laughs> Right. But I, I, I love that idea because you become in in part of the of the problem because you uh, you in that sense you are saying super explicit that my my how can I say my, my vision is super important in that project because I am choosing that image uh, because I like it uh, not because I am a super scientist that. Uh, all the, um, the numbers say that that is the important one. No, it's because I like it. it and, and because uh, I, I have my feeling in the, in, the, in the project. And that is something that for me is important also to transmit to the students that you are part of the, of the thing. You are not just a calculator. You are, <laughs> you are not a computer. You are, you are part of the, of the thing. And you are saying what is important or not in the, in the project. Yeah, they are a part of the script and the error. So, uh, so we, I mean, we are running out of time. It's, it's we are already ten minutes uh, over time. Uh, but um, if there are no comments or quick comments or questions, um, then we would sort of come to an end to the panel. Um, I don't see any questions. But if anybody uh, wants to come in, is it? Yeah, there is a, um, no, all right. So um, it it was, okay, Guillermo, you have uh, something to say? No, ah, no, because I raised my hand, no, yeah. I ju just press the bottom. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So, so thanks a lot, um, Haushan and Guillermo. I think we kind of had interesting uh, fragments of ideas that kind of came up within this. Um, and also it was lovely to see uh, all the works that kind of were presented. Um, we would like to kind of be in touch and see uh, where this thing goes ahead. Um, so with that, I would like to close the panel and uh, meet you guys um, very soon for the next one, which is uh, at 6.30 uh, IST or India time. Um, it is on uh, thinking ecologically uh, south in the South Asian context. So uh, see you guys and adios. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice, nice to, to meet you. Meet you. Yeah. Let's try to touch. Yeah. Bye bye. Yes. Bye bye.